You are watching an IT Security and the Internet of Things Asset Management webinar featuring Tony Carato, an IT architect with specific expertise and background in IT security, hosted by Don Barry of Asset Acumen Consulting. This asset management webinar is part of a series that is expected to be put out to bridge the gaps in asset management. All right, so welcome everybody to this IT security in IoT and asset management webinar. The genesis of presenting this webinar came from um, an IT and IoT asset management training seminar that uh, I facilitated about a month ago. Um, and, and it's going to be presented again in October because it was fairly well received. Tony Corrado, who you're seeing here, is, uh, was very good to, and, and kind to send me some of his insights when he realized we we're putting this presentation on. And, uh, and I ended up using two or three of his charts with his permission in that uh, seminar from last month. And some of the comments that came back were, well, that's really interesting. really hadn't thought about that, which prompted us to say, why don't we ask Tony to come and give us uh, more than just a two or three chart kind of uh, insight on this. And so we're sharing this to everybody who might be interested in, in, a, in a free webinar format. Uh, to be clear, I'm not an IT security expert. I'm used to taking advantage of folks like Tony. So um, when the insights were shared and the comments in this, uh, about the course were included from this course we did a month ago, um, it, it, it certainly suggests that we wanted to, to get more detail on this, hence why we're doing this course now. We can go to the next chart, I guess, if you like, uh, Tony, since you're driving. Okay, so some other things that we, we offer in courses, and I'll give you some, some uh, detailed dates on that later. And, and uh, there's a University of Toronto program coming up in November. Uh, but I, I offer what they either call a physical asset management or a municipal asset management program, two or four days, uh, some other asset management leading practices, reliability center maintenance practices, maintenance parts training, the IT and IoT course we did a month ago, I talked about before, and it's coming up, coming up again in October, and other things such as KPI and, and even asset data. So we don't need to get into that too much. You'll have that as a copy. And, and I think we just go on to the next chart. To introduce ourselves, and I actually want to start with Tony and I'll let Tony correct me after I've uh, talked about myself a little bit. And then Tony will just take over the, for the rest of most, most of this presentation. I've known Tony for, I was going to say 10, but certainly probably known of Tony for at least 15 years. We were both at another organization that had three letters to it, I, B, and M, IBM. Tony retired a couple of years ago. I think I retired perhaps a year ahead of him. And, uh, and he's also an open group certified distinguished IT architect and uh, has, I'm not sure what these 44 claim badges mean, but he's got 44 claim badges. He's part of a member of the steering committee for, of the security forum at the open group, currently uh, an invited expert uh, for the open group security forum. And he's uh, also CTO for a local startup. Uh, for myself, uh, I had 42 years at IBM before I, I uh, formally retired. And and I think my hobby could have been uh, quilting or continuing to do what I always did. And, and I decided, or golfing maybe, but I decided to do what I always do and continue to consult. And so we opened up a company called Asset Acumen Consulting, and we've uh, had that for about three years now. I still am and have been since 2004 an instructor at the University of Toronto. We talked about the physical asset management program, the maintenance parts excellence program. I am an RCM2 practitioner and uh, was the main contributor to a text used at the university uh, called Asset Management Excellence. So that, I guess, briefly qualifies a bit of my experience. And I really, I really want to hear from Tony. So Tony, I'll let you take over and maybe correct some of your background. Uh, well, I'm I particularly impressed with the RCMP part of your title. Uh, uh, RCM, not RCMP. Well, Roy reading what's on the slide. Re uh, Reli reliability center maintenance as opposed to <laughs> police. There's no police there. No. Okay, so let's, let's slide right into this. Don got my background just fine. I've been kicking around security for a long time. We won't even talk about how long. So Internet of Things. Don mentioned IT security. This really is where IT gets outside the data center. And for the longest time, assets were out in the world and computers were in some closed, locked up room. And there wasn't a lot of connection between them. But some years ago, um, that connection started to happen. Um, I, I mentioned Open Group talks about, and if you don't know Open Group, it's a pretty well-established, I've been involved going back to about 1990, 
uh, standards body. I'm, I'm, as Don mentioned, very active in the security forum. But talk about Internet of Things being, you know, basically identifiable stuff out there. Um, Wikipedia is always a little suspect because anybody can edit it, but it's a fair definition. How many is a lot? Mm, latest number I came up with a week or so ago was 21 billion devices, but I note it changes a lot and about a little under half a million new devices will be connected in the hour or so we're chatting together. IBM used to use a phrase which I actually quite like instrumented, intelligent, and interconnected to describe devices. And that has a lot of implications. Don and I both spent a lot of time working in the utilities and energy industry. So we grabbed examples from there. You can probably pick any industry you want and find it. Here's some going back about six years. SCADA is the system data management for uh, many things from traffic lights to hydroelectric dams. And it starts to connect these instrumented devices. What else? We're gonna talk about industrial control systems. There are a couple that really get implied over here. Schneider has them, GE has them and so on. They're used once again in many industries. If you're running a manufacturing plant, you will have connected controlling systems. I gave you a source for a report, it's free. There are lots of reports. This one, I know the folks that wrote it, it's quite good and it's quite recent. It came out in the last couple of months. Something else that came out quite recently is uh, much news about an attack on a pipeline company, Colonial Pipeline, who talks about safety 24 by seven. They sort of forgot to think about security 24 by seven and it cost them four and a half million dollars. It also cost shutting down a pipeline that supplied petrol to uh, much of the Eastern US from about the state of Georgia North and along the Eastern seaboard where quite a lot of population is. It turned out this was an attack intended to extract money. And, and when we talk about attacks, attackers only really do a few things. They may want to embarrass you. Uh, that's usually, that used to be the case a lot is the, you know, kids playing around sort of thing. They may want to break something. What more and more they want is to steal. And it's usually, but not always money. You know, and when I say usually, if you can reroute shipments of things on say containers on trains, that ends up getting turned into money, but what they took might have been stuff, not cash. And so that's the general term we're seeing more and more is ransomware. And ransomware is where somebody attacks and says, give me money or I'll do something bad to you. Some folks I know uh, and a couple of very large security organizations are talking unhappily about the fact that at the moment, this is a growth industry for bad guys. And it's mostly because we have to protect ourselves and assets are one of the ways we get attacked. In this case, the control system, industrial control systems, ICS, that actually ran the pipeline, didn't turn out to be affected, but the pipeline got shut down because the IT people and the people that live in the world of the smart assets couldn't figure out whether it was affected or not in the near term. So what's the security problem in general? Well. Lots of devices. I've talked about, you know, tens of billions of devices. Um, Bruce Schneier, who is these days at Harvard University and pretty noted security expert, has a, a good way to put it. We don't really have things with computers embedded in them or attached to them now. We have computers with things which are attached to them. In other words, the central point turns out to be more of the computer. If, you know, you have a car that's at all recent what you're driving down the road is a rolling network. Many people have smart thermostats, doorbells, et cetera, in their homes. One of the interesting things about these devices is that if you, you don't have to go back very far at all to discover that devices designed more than even a few years ago probably weren't thought about being secure. I'll talk a little more about why in a few. And most of them haven't been updated in a long time. Part of the reason for that is simply that there's a lot to update out there. And it turns out uh, 
people tend to not really have a good inventory of what they have. That doesn't mean there isn't an inventory. There's an internet search engine called Shodan. I'll give you the link to it. There's a snapshot of it from a week or two ago that looks through the, the internet, much like Google does, much like Bing does, and it captures what it can see about devices that are connected. And you can search that in all kinds of ways. You, know, you want to find a uh, version of smart thermostats running a particular software version? Okay. And when someone takes control of an intelligent connected device, remember the device is doing something, bad things can occur. Again, Don and I chose to use utilities for our examples, but we'll also be happy with questions from any other industry. We can probably uh, refer to it reasonably well, but this was one where we're pretty knowledgeable and pretty current. So utilities have lots of devices. I'll show a picture of a smart meter. Depending on where you are, um, you can end up, I've worked on uh, utility systems with, you know, four or five million smart meters. I mentioned these things were not designed to be secure. Here's why. Computing power available in the devices for a very long time was low. There also wasn't much memory in there. And th that has to do with what kind of software can you have? You know, can you process something to look at what's coming in and out? There was also a presumption that you weren't internet connected. Well, if you're running solar power at home, you can probably from your phone, look at the production of your uh, solar power which means, oh, you actually are internet connected. And that extends lots of places. Engineers, operators of all sorts, data scientists want to be able to see what's going on, do analytics, and in fact, take controlling actions. So now we've connected things and that means the gates got opened. Enough attacks happen that it's now got a name. Jackware, uh, use a term that's starting to show up, hijacking devices. I give you a link here to an article um, on Yahoo's news that I thought was pretty good. So what we can conclude about these assets, which is what I mean when I say IoT devices. Well, they've been out in the wild for a long time, often decades. When I say in the wild, what do I mean? It means you can probably walk right up to it. I did a project for a US city who uh, was talking about water pumps and uh, I said, can we get the, uh, the accurate locations of these? Because we were doing some analytics. They said, oh, I don't know, we can tell you that for security. There was a large park that had three of them. I said, um, you understand I can drive to the park, walk around it with my, uh, my phone and mark the GPS locations of these things, right? Oh yeah, they're in the wild. In many cases, the networks connecting these devices are not that rapid, not fast. And that means they don't tend to get updated very often. In addition, people don't think about it. Okay. Analog in your house, how often do you update your home internet router? Mine, by the way, was uh, about 10 days ago. But, you know, deploying all these devices increases something that security people call the attack surface of your network. In other words, the exposed areas someone can reach out and touch. And this is a, a real thing. We're going to show a, a video of it in just a moment. Uh, U.S. Homeland Security decided to try and understand uh, how protected the grid was. So in this case, they actually got not a so much a utility generator, but this one I believe came from a mine site, but it's a huge device. And they wrote about 20 lines of code, which essentially flips it on and off causing the generator to cycle in bad ways. And we've got the link here, and here we go. So, so there's the device. This is done 14 years ago. This is not recent. And what you're seeing is the effect on the unit of turning on and off the connection between it and the, the load it's providing power to, which you can think of as the grid. Suddenly, uh, smoke starts coming out. And as many of you as asset managers know, the machinery depends on smoke. If you let it out, that's an indication something bad has occurred. And 
And this is an official U.S. Department of Homeland Security uh, video that they shared with the taxpayers who paid for them to do it. So not good is the short answer. Okay, so that's an example, a reasonably graphic such example. Other examples, uh, there's a company in Texas called uh, Line Star, play on Lone Star, which is the alternate name for Texas, the Lone Star State. They pay attention to compliance, including safety. So what happened? Somebody which they're believed to be in China called the Jin team decided to uh, help themselves to their data, which basically pointed to other pipelines out there and would enable attacking. So part of the message in this is, it's not just your assets, it's your partners. How are you working with them and who owns what accountability for security? This one uh, made the use, news in the US, I'm not sure if it got into Canada uh, or elsewhere, but uh, central, utility, central Florida water utility. And these happen weekly. In this case, somebody got after their systems using a remote access tool called TeamViewer, which basically enables remote access, say from home, you may have run into work from home lately, for people managing their systems, like engineers. The access credentials were found in online data breaches. And those are generally, uh, depending on what you're running for security software, you may get notified of that or you may not. Somebody popped into it and they decided, let's see if we can poison people. So they tried to uh, load, uh, what is it? Sodium hydroxide, lye, which is used in water utilities. They tried to overload it. The system couldn't actually do that, so it popped the flag. This was through the controlling system. I mentioned industrial control systems to drive the devices to do something, which in this case, fortunately, did not work. And so we've talked about electrical, gas, water. I'm going to shift to different industries now for a moment. Remember, I said that people tend to want to do one of a few things, embarrass you, break things, steal things. And if you think about those examples, the generator was a break things. You can argue that the water utility was pretty embarrassed. There was no financial outcome. Here are some steal things. These are accessing via assets into an enterprise network because your assets typically don't hold money exactly. Some years ago, Target Corporation, stores all over the world, one of their vendors was running their HVAC system and it's kind of nice, they were taking care of it for them, but they weren't taking care of security. So the notion was that there was a cordon around that system to keep them out of anything else. The trouble is the cordon didn't work very well. So people came in through the engineering control system meant to protect assets. They installed card stealing malware onto a few intelligent cash registers and then propagated out. I, I mentioned the notion of blast radius, you know, spreading the attack. And that led to uh, C-level executives losing cushy, well-paid jobs. Just for fun, casinos like to have entertaining experiences for people like Cool fish tanks. Well, if the fish tank is connected to a control system. The most common way people do that is through an internet protocol. And if you don't protect your network, that really doesn't just mean internet protocol, but internet itself. People got into the casino database and moved about 10 gigs worth of data out to a server in Finland, which would then, if it hadn't been caught, been moved elsewhere. And this equals money. And why? Were they able to do this? Well, an asset that was not well protected. There's a model for these things. This is called the Purdue reference model from the university uh, in the US. Down at the bottom are your physical devices. Above that are controllers. And eventually as you climb the stack, you get into an enterprise system, which is notionally protected by 
layers of security zones. That's notionally protected in the same way that the networks in your car are notionally protected. In your car, there's a network that runs the vehicle and a separate network that runs all the ancillary systems like radios and so on. Those are supposed to be separate. They're not in most cases. You wanna have a little fun. I didn't uh, include it in this one, but if you search for J-E-E-P hack, you'll find a pretty good demonstration of the bad things you can do to a recent model uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee as an example. Now, you folks are probably in the asset management business, maybe work with people in the IT and IT security business, or even are in that side. So we thought you ought to be able to take some practical things away from this discussion other than just, you know, stuff you could have done by searching for hacks yourself. So if you're acquiring and deploying intelligent devices and devices are usually part of the solution, what should you be looking for and maybe what should you do? So I mentioned these devices aren't updated very often, but it's just about a guarantee that any device out there is going to need updating periodically. So the question then is, is there a secure update mechanism provided by the vendor? Or are you going to have to uh, invent one or hire consultants to write one for you? That to me would be an important question. Next thing is, how does the vendor uh, associated with this manage their vulnerability awareness. And when they know about something, do they tell you? In the US, about a month or a little bit more ago, the president signed an executive order talking about cybersecurity. And one of the things in that was an expectation, um, a requirement, in fact, that vendors share vulnerability information appropriately. Keeping stuff secret doesn't work very well. Hackers can find things you need to know too. One other point to note is updates, when they come in, talk about a secure update mechanism. You really wanna know that the device or set of devices, which may be thousands up to potentially millions that are getting updates, know where they're coming from and can validate them. You don't wanna let just anybody update your devices. That's generally not a good thing. An area you know people try and fiddle with all the time in utilities is, can I fool the metering system? You know, as in get my electricity for free or a lot cheaper than maybe it ought to be. Uh, you know, and if you let them update your system and that is one of the approaches used, that isn't good. Uh, a man in the middle attack is the idea is somebody stands in between the genuine source of of update and the device and injects their own updates. So you wanna have discussions with your vendor about these kinds of things. An absolute classic and, and really pretty unfortunate, but the reason it's classic is it's out there and it still works. Remember the devices you put out there tend to have better or worse documentation, but something that's in an awful lot of them is the admin password. It would be really nice if devices came with unique passwords per device. I'm not convinced that's going to be real likely when you get into very large numbers of devices. But when you are deploying these into the field or managing them when they're already deployed, one of the most fundamental things to do is change the default password. Use reasonable passwords. P-A-S-S-W-0-R-D is not a reasonable password. One, two, three, four, five, six is not a reasonable password. And by the way, uh, for those of you on various forms of social media like Facebook, you probably see all kinds of questions that get thrown around that make security guys like me cringe. What was your first dog? What car did you learn to drive in? Why? Those are really common answers to security questions. So 
be wary of those things as well. But how do you do password management? How do you protect the passwords? There are password managers for people. There are equivalents for enterprises. Next thing, intelligent assets are connected to the rest of your enterprise. And they're typically connected to physical stuff, like maybe uh, an intelligent weather station, which lots, there are hundreds of thousands of, you know, home weather stations out there. And just as one example, you go into factories. I was talking to somebody in Asia quite recently. Who, I have to admit, I may have been less polite than I could have been because when he told me this, I started laughing. He had 150 factories, which he said were all air-gapped. air gap means there is no connection between their systems and anything. And the reason I started laughing is when you start talking about order management, inventory management, little issues like issuing invoices and paying bills, well, you know, all that stuff tends to be connected. The idea you've got 150 factories, none of which have connections between the systems controlling the production machinery and anything else is in fact laughable. So you will have ecosystem interfaces. Your ecosystem varies depending on what kind of industry you're in, but the odds are really good. You're gonna end up talking to backend corporate systems and databases. There will be this thing called an API. That's a way a program can talk to something if you don't speak that particular form of geekiness. How is it protected? Can anybody inject requests and commands? That's often the default. You don't want that. The other thing is data moves around. Data moves around in lots of ways. There are cases every few years, they're a little less than they used to be, used to be every few months of somebody leaving a you know, briefcase with removable devices in a taxi or some such. There was one in the uh, UK that a Ministry of Defense uh, employee managed to do that. That's generally not a good thing. More commonly, we move data through something that feels internet-like, which may be over the air. And remember, a cell phone or a cellular radio is in fact a radio. Anybody with an appropriate receiver can listen to it. And you have to ask, well, if they can listen, can they actually do anything with the data? Can they see the data? Am I properly encrypted? Expect that you have to look at how data moves around from your devices, how commands move back to your devices. How are those protected? This is something you want to talk to your implementation teams and vendors about. Tell me how you're doing this. The other thing to be aware of is physical security. One of the rules in technology is if I can put my hands on a device and bring it into my laboratory, I can probably start doing interesting things with it. There was a report in the last couple days of a criminal gang in Romania attacking ATM machines, all driven from an original smart card for a bank account from Austria. And what it actually used was a little device they built that slides into, it's, it's called a skimmer, the ATM machine. This one actually went in, it still was left enough room for your card to go in like a cash card, but it wrapped it around and captured data. And depending on uh, how they did it, it either simply held it till somebody wandered up and downloaded the data physically, uh, it was most common, or maybe put it through a network. These folks, again, in Romania, and where they were mostly doing their stealing was in Mexico, using a bank account that originated in Austria, uh, had a lab and they built these things based on getting their hands on particular models of ATMs, you can buy them, doing engineering and getting it back out into the world. This applies to all kinds of smart assets. They are for sale. And some vendors are a lot more scrupulous than others about who they sell to and knowing what it's used for. When Don and I were at IBM, you had to go through training regularly on 
you know, export management of devices, where are they getting sent? But the real important thing is if someone can physically access the computer motherboard or whatever that's in the device, they can do things to that device, including understand what's in there and how it works. So you have to plan for that. We talk about in security, a notion we call assumed breach. In other words, assume someone has broken into a system, how are you gonna contain that breach in the most effective way? In other words, reduce the blast radius, notice things are going on and respond. Now, if you're over on the IT or IT security side and you're taking care of a lot of IoT devices, you're supporting an asset management organization, deploying or updating them, what should you be doing? And I would also say, for those of you on the asset management side, these are discussions you can have with your security team. Well, the first thing is security is normally governed by a thing called a security architecture, a document that describes a lot of how you're gonna do things. First thing is, have you got one of those? Can they show it to you? If, uh, if an IT security organization tells somebody responsible for a major fleet of assets, oh, I'm sorry, we can't show you the security architecture, it's too secret. I think you have a problem you need to sort out right there. When you look at it, does it talk about intelligent devices? By the way, intelligent devices also include things like phones, and so on. You know, do you have rules? Okay, standards and policies. When someone is providing devices, have the security people, they, they're not there to pick the vendors for you. They are there to tell you, we have some things the vendors need to do. That's usually in the world of security and policies. Now, if you're building solutions, I mean, buying devices doesn't equal a solution. It equals a warehouse full of devices. So how's the solution that's going to extract business value from these get built? Is it internal? Are you working with a partner? Do you understand how the development team's working? Is there some influence on that? This is where your IT partner in your organization should be helping you, but it needs to be a dialogue. Uh, there was a study that came out in the last week or so looking at U.S. water utilities and something on the order of 40% of them do not have a proper inventory of the intelligent devices connected to their network at all, much less knowing things like what versions of software. I talked about vulnerability management. How are your vendors keeping you informed? Can you update these devices? How? I also talked about the notion of assumed breach. Assume someone may already have broken in. Uh, a security concept, it's um, starting to be mainstream. It's been around for actually 10 or 11 years now. So this notion of zero trust, what that means is you think about your network as collections of assets of all sorts. They may be physical assets, they may be data system assets and so on, but those assets have to be protected, not just having the, if you can log on to the network, you can get at all things. So those questions need to be considered. You have to think about, is your architecture updated? Given that you have an architecture document, how are people making use of it? Um, and that's not just in development, but in operations. And as a owner of assets in an organization, you need to be involved in these discussions. We tend to like to tell you where you can learn more. Now, Don has already talked about where Asset Acumen brings a lot of knowledge in a number of areas that I don't bring any knowledge in. There's a number of papers published that can be read through. Um, some of them get pretty geeky, some of them are a little less geeky, but places to learn more. And with that, I guess we're uh, ready to take questions and I'll turn that back over to Don. Appreciate that, uh, Tony. A couple of comments as I went through it. I was thinking I could interject questions, but I thought you're, I didn't want to interrupt you. You're doing quite well there. One of the common things that I see, and by the way, if you have questions, folks, if you wouldn't mind just putting it in the chat section, that would be helpful. Or if you, if we really get dead air, maybe we'll open up the microphone. But for now, if you put it in the chat section, that, that'd be good. I don't have any questions on the chat just yet. So if you have any, please, uh, please share it. 
Yeah. IoT devices. One of the common things I found, especially from a reliability guy, is uh, the more protection devices you have in your organization, and then I'll call IoT devices are not necessarily protection devices, they're more or less data collection, data interpretation devices, the more things an asset management ha person has to manage. And uh, I think it's very common that the protection devices are not necessarily in their EIM solution. And chances are their IoT devices are not necessarily in their EIM solution. So there's, there's a lot of, of potential work there that I think just sort of opens up the mind that uh, people haven't necessarily given a lot of thought to. The next one is the average asset management person doesn't think about software version updates or whether the asset is updatable. Um, so do you have any comments on that? Have you seen much of that in your, your uh, experience? So the answer is, relates really well to the question Eli just asked, which is the interlock between asset management and the people over on the information security side. I talk about governance quite a lot. The first thing is you, you have to break down barriers. You have to provide resources. So it's great to say you should go talk to your information security people. How do people find out who these folks even are? And how do you engage them when you're deploying more intelligent uh, devices? I'm not sure if I'm quite answering your question. Or not. It's more of a statement that are you okay. finding people kind of going, well, yeah, we're, 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 we're busy keeping track of our assets, which are not necessarily in an in a asset management system, okay. a hierarchy, right? The answer is absolutely. But, but I'm not even keeping, but so how do I keep track of all this IoT stuff that we're, you know, the sensor stuff and, and the expert systems that go with it, right? So, so the first thing is when you order stuff, you know, 100,000 of some smart asset, at a minimum, you knew that. I presume that when they're received, they're logged into your systems. And as they're deployed, that's being done too, tracking. Mm -hmm. And that's really important, but you don't want that information to go away when the deployment project ends. So I would start with, are you tracking things and what are you tracking? And, and if you're not tracking things like software versions, you should be. And that's also why I said you want to go get somebody to take you through the security architecture and look at how it addresses intelligent assets. You know, and if it isn't addressing them, you need to spend some time. Right. So, now, so, there's, so you got to have it. You also got to have sort of the status of it. And what's it addressing and what are the risk elements we need to manage? It should be reasonably straightforward for an asset management VP to say, give me a list of all of my intelligent assets that have not had a software update in three years. <laughs> it's reasonably, it's reasonable to ask it. The question is, can anybody really ever ask, answer it? That, that's, that's, well, that's my, 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 my uh, fear, right? Yeah. Like I said, if you can't, you have a problem. Yeah. Let's see. Raj asks internal structure recommended to address cyber dedicated teams. A couple issues here. First of all, cyber skills are sadly, we just don't have anywhere near enough. You see numbers that sometimes are pretty crazy, like 450,000 open cyber positions in the US alone. I don't believe that. But 50,000, I believe pretty easily. So you start having to think about, do you have someone responsible for something that you might think of as technology security? They might roll up to a chief information officer. They might roll up to a corporate risk manager. But do you have that at all? Within that, there's probably a technical role called security architect. There are never enough of these people. There just aren't because it's not a trivial set of skills. I spent uh, decades getting to where I'm at. Now, somebody smarter than me might do it in less time, but still in all. So we start talking about a lesser skill level. We tend to call security champions who are educated to work with your various teams. So there ought to be, number one, who owns security? Who's the technical lead in it? Do they have people to work with your teams? That would be the, the main thing. And then hardware question from Femi. Diodes is a notion of something that permits transmission only in one direction. It comes back from circuit design long ago. The answer really is no, there aren't devices you can just plug in your network. Uh, 
far too much uh, software in there. So you, you have to approach it as software plus hardware. Uh, who does the responsibility for updates fall on is the question from David. Couple, couple things about that. And Don, you're probably gonna wanna chime in on this. When you're deploying 100,000 plus assets, that's not something that happens in a week. You did one in Canada was what, a two year update? Two year project? For uh, asset management alone? Yeah, I've done them much sometimes for four years. I mean, they, they take a while. So one thing that carries with it is count on there being updates occurring within that. So it's back to, you can't manage what you can't measure. Do you have a way to keep track? When new devices come in that are purportedly the same device, what version of software and firmware is it running? Does that carry with it things that need to be updated back to your existing systems? But at some point that project finishes. You still need to keep track. And as I mentioned in the talk, you need to be working with your vendors to say when a vulnerability is reported, how am I gonna know? Somebody in uh, BC encounters a vulnerability and reports it, you know, how does the uh, entity operating on Prince Edward Island know about it, that they even need to do anything? Yeah. So you, it, you've got to have some ongoing partnership and it can fit into a PM schedule. IT might manage it for you if they even know they should, but you have to have that stuff written down. I, I'm very wary of handshake agreements that people will not remember in six months. Yeah, my, my comment there, Tony, is, is the average asset management maintenance guy, unless he is fixing computers you know, or, or has machine control type responsibilities and those kinds of things, is not thinking about software updates. So you need somebody that is thinking about software updates as part of that PM process. Um, you need someone that looks at the overall security risk um, traditionally, we, there's IT asset management and then there's asset management. So IT asset management, the primarily difference is you're looking at versions of software, you're looking at whether it's updatable, you're looking about, you know, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, so there's more data elements. Uh, those kinds of things certainly could be put into a standard asset management software. It's not, it's not terrible rocket science. But there's whole markets out there that just do IT asset versus asset management. Right. And, and, and they often use the term configuration management too. One yeah. of the big differences is the IT people still have this mental picture of walls around their assets with a locked door. Huh. And when you say, oh, this thing is up on a pole in uh, you know, the Yukon, IT guys tend to go, uh, yeah, and why would I care about that? I think it's pretty cold there and they have bears. <laughs> you know, the reality is stuff out in the world provides, I gave a couple of examples, access back into other things. Yeah. Now, Eli asked a question about, given there are so many unfilled positions, you know, one of the, one of the issues is, it, it's kind of in his question, First of all, people tend to be hiring wrong. It's nice to look for people with 10 years experience and want to pay them um, using, you know, U.S. salary rates, $70,000 a year. Well, you won't get any. I am a believer in if you can find people with the right attitude and background, you, you, what you want is an employee that will grow with you and be loyal to you and stick around. So there's a whole HR question in here of, Let's not ask for silly credentials we can't get unless we're willing to pay impressive money. Let's look at how do we bring people in that have the right basics, grow them into the job, and make them want to stay with the organization. Reliability center maintenance is a risk and reliability argument here too. When you take when you look at an asset, let's let's pretend we're looking at that uh, generator thing that kind of smoked up a little bit that you showed the video on part of the reliability comments are what's a reasonable likely issue that could happen. And terrorism is not something that people gonna, can fluff off anymore. Uh, if, if you were looking at uh, power utilities, you might say, well, is, 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 is a terrorist attack something that could happen? Well, you hope not, but I'll tell you, the nuclear plants I've been to certainly have armed guards around them. So they must realize that that's an, an issue. And there's a lot ways, a lot more ways to get at this stuff without necessarily getting at it through the front door. As in, the like, utilities in the Ukraine a couple of years ago were all taken down by the Russians. 
just as a trial for cyber attack software. Right. Absolutely happens. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we'll cut the questions off there. I appreciate your comment. Um, I just want to show a, a chart. Hopefully, if you could um, just un, uh, unshare there. Every organization I've walked into has been different. Um, some of them, and, and there's a long discussion about how you could describe that, but some people are still very much doing things manually. If you're doing it manually, you probably don't have to worry too much about IT security. But in the EAM solution, people are stumbling to, to get all the assets into that enterprise asset management solution, which is what I call the EAM solution or what Gartner calls that. Primarily, that's where 95% of the organizations today are focused. They're focused on just getting their enterprise asset management solution in place. And if they do, they're going to have asset hierarchies in there. And hopefully they've considered the IoT devices and hopefully they've considered putting in the, the software update data and, and updatable, you know, if, if the software is updatable and how are those kinds of things there so people can manage this and do their PMs on an ongoing basis. The continuum, though, also says, well, how do I pick the right maintenance to, to do efficiently? Because primarily EAM is keep your assets and execute maintenance efficiently through planned and scheduled maintenance, right? So if I plan it right and schedule it right, I can execute it efficiently. Effective maintenance, maintenance is all about going deeper into the asset and say, how could this thing fail? And part of that is the whole risk and reliability, if you like RCM reliability center maintenance approach. And in that could be the argument of, you know, could we have IT security as a risk? Is that an issue? Perhaps it fits there, but it shouldn't start there. It should have happened even before you, you put in your asset to begin with, which I think is a message Tony's at. Depending upon where your organization is and their maturity, though, your assets exist for a strategic value reason. Arguably, your assets part of a supply chain. And so a lot of the training that we provide at Asset Acumen is really to help people through this continuum. A lot of it involves asset strategy. It could also involve IT support strategies, uh, which Tony would, would have a lot of insight on. And I would argue that the, uh, the words, the good words and insights he's given us kind of would apply there. And none of this happens without people. I mean, uh, generally speaking, when you're dealing in asset management, asset management is a 60% people exercise and maybe a 25% process exercise and really 15% IT exercise. But if you really plan to be successful, so recognize as complex as we just talked about IT, all the other things you've got to drag with you to be successful. So the other comment I wanted to make is just uh, for those who might want to know what's also going on in terms of some of the sessions we've got planned this session, which I, for some reason didn't put in there, which is kind of silly. Me. So no, so we've done, sorry, we've done the security session now. That's where we've got the first one. Uh, we're going to do an asset management reliability trend session in September. Um, the, the IT and IOT in asset management course that we did back in May, we're going to rerun that uh, on the 7th of October course that I teach at the University of Toronto, which is a five-day course, is, uh, is something that you could register for at the university. Some of these are free. Some of these have a fee. So we'll send that to you and you can look them up at your leisure. And with that, uh, Tony, I'm going to stop uh, on the, uh, the uh, recording and really thank you for your time and your insights. And uh, on behalf of everybody on the call, thank you. And, and if you have any questions, send them to me. I'll redirect it to Tony. If you want a copy of this presentation, send me that request and I'm happy to, to fill that out for you as well. Thank you.